The good thing about Extreme Rules being the first post-WrestleMania pay-per-view event for the WWE every year is it kind of helps fill the void that is left by the post-WrestleMania lull. And I don't care what anybody says, there's always a bit of a lull post-WrestleMania. It's natural. You're building up to your biggest show of the year. No matter how good you do with that show, the build-up to that show, and the follow-up in the aftermath of that show, there's always going to be a bit of a lull. It's natural. It's understandable. The good thing, though, with Extreme Rules is because of the type of stipulation for the event and that a lot of times the stories heading into that show in a lot of cases are actually the blow-offs in many cases to what actually took place at WrestleMania. There have been times where Extreme Rules has been as good as WrestleMania, if not better than WrestleMania. And usually, if nothing else, you know that Extreme Rules as a show is ultimately going to produce... Uh, as a pay-per-view event for WWE, especially to those hardcore fans that value the in-ring product. That's a good thing about Extreme Rules. It's perfectly placed post-WrestleMania, in my opinion. However, I've always found it curious uh, that WWE has a pay-per-view event like Extreme Rules because to me it kind of speaks to the confusion within WWE about who they are and kind of speaks to the lack of a real true identity for the company. Look, a lot of us will sit there and talk about this being a PG company and they're kid and family friendly and they said screw the 18 to 34 year old males and da 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 da. But the fact is they're also confusing themselves and all of us and I think they're really unsure of who they're exactly trying to go after when you have a stipulation pay-per-view like Extreme Rules where you have steel cage matches, you have street fights, you have chain matches, last man standing matches, a kiss my arse match. You know, are you really appealing to kids and families with this type of show in which in this type of event? No, not really. It's just it's a very interesting kind of dynamic there for me when it comes to WWE because you take your most mainstream of mainstream shows in the entire year of WrestleMania and follow that up with probably the most hardcore of shows that you do all year that appeals most to the hardcore fans and extreme rules. I will have to say this year is that there really has been a post-WrestleMania lull for me and I'm sure I'm not the only one because frankly there was a lull this year heading into WrestleMania. I most certainly didn't exit that lull at WrestleMania, and it has only continued post-WrestleMania. And that could be, again, me just being, you know, really kind of, you know, not invested in the product currently. That's fair. But I think in general, there's a lack of real buzz or excitement heading into this year's Extreme Rules. I don't think I'm the only one that fits in that category, nor do I think it's anywhere close to just being me. I think a lot of fans both kind of more casual, more mainstream, and even the hardcore fans are kind of like, with this company right now and with their product. You know, so I look to Extreme Rules to at least, if anything else, produce a good show. That's what I need as a fan, and that's what I hope for it to produce, and I'm sure, again, I'm not the only one. So what are we actually looking at with this show, and what's actually going to happen, and what should we expect? Well, here's some of the big things that I'm looking at. You've got possibly no Daniel Bryan defending the Intercontinental Championship. And I, I do have to say this, and not just to pour salt on the wounds, but seriously, this speaks to this whole kind of Daniel Bryan fascination and nut-hugging. There were many that thought he should have main-evented WrestleMania, that he should have beat Brock Lesnar straight up clean for the title at WrestleMania. Well, if you would have done that this year... You'd have been in the exact same fucking situation as last year, except almost instantaneously, as opposed to having to wait a couple of months for it to happen. This is sometimes why the WWE shouldn't listen to fans, and can't listen to fans, and sometimes why we can't book shit, and we wouldn't do better, because we would do dumb shit like this. Imagine how much Extreme Rules would be in turmoil, and be in flux, and be all shook up if Daniel Bryan actually was the WWE World Heavyweight Champion right now. Just think about that for a second. Or even if he was heading into the match and maybe Seth Rollins had cashed in on him at WrestleMania and it was him and Daniel Bryan main eventing the show. Just think about that for a second. Maybe there's a reason WWE didn't get behind him. Maybe there's a reason WWE didn't put him in that spot. And now, looking at what's happened post-WrestleMania, I think the WWE, in some ways, should be vindicated 
for what they did because they clearly made the right decision. And frankly, I can't believe I'm saying this, a lot of you does, should, at least I should say should, uh, be extending an apology the WWE's way because they made the right decision. You still got one of your guys, Seth Rollins, to be the champion anyways, but the company is so much better off because they didn't fucking listen to you. And frankly, when you're talking about the fact that they were trying to build up the IC title into meaning more, putting it on Daniel Bryan, knowing some of the potential risks, was probably a mistake in some ways. He was a perfect guy to have it. It was a good decision to win. But at the same point in time, it wasn't the right decision. It wasn't a good decision. And now you're talking about him not being on this show. It most certainly doesn't help. Now you're talking about a show that I think had, what, seven matches scheduled on it. Now if there's no IC title match, that brings it down to six. Could there be another filler match thrown in? Um, you know, what else are you seeing? You're talking about, you know, Dolph Ziggler is going to be jobbing. I don't understand how a Kiss My Arse match equates to an Extreme Rules type of stipulation. I really don't. You can see where this is going. Sheamus is going to bulldoze through Dolph Ziggler and begin his build up to winning money in the bank this year. That's what I think is going to happen. I'm not saying it's the wrong decision because I agree. I think that's the guy that should win money in the bank. I just don't know why they necessarily have to throw Dolph Ziggler under the bus. And frankly, I don't know why the WWE wastes our time with Dolph Ziggler anymore. And they're not going to get behind him. And they're never going to take him seriously. And they're never really truly going to do anything with him. Then why bother with him? Why not just completely let him go? I mean, seriously, you think about it now. Dolph Ziggler has been with the company for damn near a decade. It's long since past shit or get off the pot time. And you're going from the guy that won for Team Cena at Survivor Series to now the guy who is destined to job for one of the Breakfast Club members at Extreme Rules in a Kiss My Arse match. You know Vince and Kevin Dunn are going to get great jollies to the thought of Dolph Ziggler having to kiss another man's ass. Oh, Christ almighty. What else we got? We got Reigns versus The Big Show and what will truly be a last man standing match because God knows watching anything involving The Big Show is a big time chore at this point. And watching Roman Reigns versus Big Show again in a match is most certainly going to be a chore and is perfectly named as a last man standing. Look, this doesn't have a lot of element of surprise here. You can pretty much guarantee you would think, you would think, stranger shit has happened though, that Roman Reigns would knock out Big Show and that Roman Reigns would win here. But knowing the WWE and the way they've really gravitated to the over 40 crowd lately with Kane and even Big Show, and fuck, it wouldn't even surprise me at this point if Big Show knocked out Roman Reigns and he was out for a couple of weeks or a couple of months. Or right back on Raw the next night. Um, this is going to be bad. This is going to be awkward. That Chicago crowd, I'm sure, is going to have a lot of fun at the expense of this match. And frankly, who could blame them? This is the best thing you've got for Roman Reigns. This is how you're trying to build this guy up into a star. It is last man standing on so many different levels. I expect Dean Ambrose and Luke Harper to have a pretty good Chicago street fight. I don't think it's going to be anything epic. I don't know that it's necessarily going to get the full time. But when I look at guys like Harper and especially Ambrose, I see their skill sets being very well suited towards this type of street fight. Now, usually it's really hard to have a bad street fight, let's be honest. You pretty much can almost guarantee that the street fight is going to be good. That's almost a given and accepted going in. Because fans are going to like the extreme shit and da-da-da-da-da. The violence is going to tell some type of story. So I want it to be more than just good. It doesn't need to just be good. It needs to be more than good. It needs to be really good. And I hope what this means is that they will give Ambrose his victory here and they will actually start to build him up and get back on his track heading into the summer of 2015, which is something that they should have never gotten off of the track with him to begin with. You know, as much as people talk about John Cena and the U.S. title open challenge that he does every week and so many people like it and I have my thoughts on it, both pros and cons, Part of the problem with this post-WrestleMania is that the feud between him and Rusev has frankly taken a backseat to the point where it barely even exists, at least from a Raw standpoint. I'm not watching SmackDown. I don't watch the app shit. I don't watch a lot of that crap. So maybe there's other stuff that I'm not seeing. But again, if I'm not seeing it, it's like it didn't happen. And as far as I'm concerned, based off of what I've observed on the past few Raws post-WrestleMania... It's like they've already moved on from Cena versus Rusev. Instead of turning this into a big-time issue, into a big-time blow-off match, they've made it well known that Cena is the guy, and you have absolutely no doubts about who's going to win the match. You have absolutely none. And it's not just because of the fact 
That is John Cena, although that's mostly the reason why you have no doubts. But it's about more than that. If Rusev can barely be bothered to show up, if Rusev is barely featured, what the hell is a fan supposed to think? And I think it's an incredibly hard way to build interest in a match. You could throw Russian chains in there all day long, and you could do all this type of crap. Again, Russian chain match for a PG company kind of speaks to the lack of identity and the WWE's confusion about who they are and what their product should be. But why even really, frankly, bother having this match when we know where it's going to go? Why bother getting interested in it when the WWE didn't seem that interested in it? Why should we be excited about it when it's going to be one of your big feature matches on this card? You know, it's, it's, it's going to be high up on the card if you already know what the result's going to be. It's going to be 10 to 15 minutes where it's a circle jerk and we waste our time and it's LOL Cena wins. And that's one of the major problems of Cena being the U.S. champion, is that it's going to get to that point where it will start to feel like a waste of time because you know how this story ends. You know how this is going to go. It's going to end up, LOL, Cena wins. Now, I am really looking forward to the steel cage match for the WWE World Heavyweight Championship between Randy Orton and Seth Rollins. I like the fact that the RKO is banned because I think, again, that makes a lot of sense from a Seth Rollins standpoint. You want to take away Randy Orton's biggest, most dangerous weapon, and they did a good job of building that up on Raw about Randy Orton and just how dangerous the RKO can be. So it makes sense that the heel would want to take that away. I'm still not sold on why Randy Orton thought the best way to keep everybody else out was a steel cage match when you have both a door and a open top to be able to gain entry. It just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. But the guys can really work a good match together. I think their styles really mesh and gel well. I think they just started to scratch the surface of what they could do at WrestleMania before their match was cut too short. Uh, so this could be really good. This could feel like a title match that should main event a pay-per-view featuring one of your established stars of the past decade versus one of your future stars for the next decade. There's a lot of elements that I really like about this, and I fully expect this to be the match of the night and be the match that we remember and you know be worthy of being a pay-per-view main event. However, there is that feeling of dread and concern on my part because I have a feeling that a lot of the story is going to be about Kane, and it doesn't need to be about Kane, so will the focus on Kane take away from the match itself? Instead of it just letting it be Randy Orton versus Seth Rollins, or maybe Orton, the babyface, goes over on Rollins again, and he beats him, and then you've got a reason to continue the story, or Seth Rollins figures out a way to beat Randy Orton, and then you go from there, you know, maybe Rollins gets a, some type of vindicating victory, it's just the potential for so many screwy, wishy-washy type of things to happen. It just kind of makes you like, uh. And, you know, with April being a free month for the WWE Network, for new subscribers, of course, only new subscribers, uh, it feels like this show is perfectly placed. Because in a lot of ways, frankly, Extreme Rules 2015 feels like a show that you should be giving away for free. This doesn't feel like a show that you should be charging 50 bucks for on pay-per-view, let alone $9.99 on the WWE Network. I don't think the effort level heading into the show has been particularly good. I don't think the execution heading into the show has been particularly good. I don't think the effort heading into this show has been particularly good. I think Extreme Rules will stand as at least an adequate to solid filler pay-per-view as it usually does, if nothing else, because of the stipulations of the matches and what the guys are able to do within those matches. But, you know, in general... It's going to be, to me, another kind of forgettable show, and especially if it's building up to you know, Kane being involved in a title match at the next pay-per-view. Oh, Christ almighty, shoot me now. I'm sure for the hardcore fans, it'll have enough elements where you can look over some of the other crap, and that's probably what's going to happen with me come Sunday. I'm definitely not expecting anything great, as God knows I wouldn't expect anything like that from the WWE nowadays.